a place where we gather to obsess about our lawn and garden, where I and some of the most influential gardeners share experiences in our journey to create masterpieces using nature as our muse, tips, tricks, and everything in between are coming right up. Welcome to the Art of Gardening. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Gardening. I'm your host, Melissa Lalo Johnson, and I am thrilled to introduce to you my very first guest, Kurt Wilkinson, the amazing gardener who has given me so much inspiration for my own yard and garden. And I am very excited to have you here. Thanks so much for joining me today, Kurt. Uh, it's a pleasure, Mel. It's, um, there's been some teething problems, but we've made it. So <laughs> let's, um, let's uh, start the process. Very good. Well, tell our viewers and listeners about where you live and what type of growing conditions you have, and then go ahead and tell them a little bit about yourself and what you're doing. Okay, so I live um, in Adelaide, South Australia, which is obviously is in Australia. It is a very Mediterranean climate, so very, very hot summers. We can get up to 50 degrees centigrade, which is well over presumably 120 degrees Fahrenheit at times in summer, and so it is very, very harsh. We would get over 40 degrees often. Um, our winters are quite mild. We do not get snow. Sometimes I'll get some frost. In other areas, you will get frost and maybe just the tiniest bit of snow every now and again. But um, so that very heavily controls how I garden. And, um, uh, and that has changed and evolved over the last 10 years because I was very much my, my profession or job as a professional gardener. I maintain gardens and try and bring them up to a very high standard. And then that's in Adelaide where the conditions are a bit milder um, and protected. Whereas I'm in a very exposed site, probably about 40 kilometers out of Adelaide, the city. And um, I bought this property a bit over 10 years ago and thought, fantastic, I'm just gonna go for it. But uh, nature decided otherwise and um, I failed for a very long time and it was very hard to, to cope with because I think I'm a very good gardener. And um, when things don't work out as you think, it is very uh, hard to handle. And having said that, I think many gardeners all around the world, I'm sure you have this too, Mel, where you come across these challenges that you never were expecting to have to face and, and just curious as to why a certain plant or numerous plants don't survive, you think, this, this plant should grow and it doesn't. And I had that problem in spades. And, um, and so it completely changed the way I garden um, from being very, very formal, very controlled. Uh, all my clients is like, you know, try to keep not a leaf out of place, that kind of thing. Very, very high level, intense, high maintenance, lots of energy inputs. And I just found I couldn't do that at my place. And my place is, is three acres, it's very large and continues to get bigger. And so I just sort of went down this process or a journey where I just kept on just learning really and changing my point of view and how I go about gardening. And um, now, now it's just chaos. It's, oh, it's, it. yes. it's, it's out of control. Chaos. So um, yeah. So one thing I want to touch on, you know, you're one of the very first people or the only person that really kind of introduced me to wild gardening. And when I would watch your, or look at your pictures and look at your posts and the videos, you know, I love when you post the videos kind of panning. And it was so amazing to me that you were able to take the look of the wild, but then still leave formal elements of the beautifully rounded boxwood and things like that to give it a level of maintenance but still have the wild and the formal kind of clashing together, which was amazing for me. So can you tell me a little bit about how your style developed and like how that's kind of come to be what it is today? Well, I suppose I've been in transition for a long time. And so when I started the garden, I trialed a number of plants because I can't grow the same plants that um, I use to make formal structure in Adelaide because the conditions are just too harsh. And even then I knew the conditions were gonna be harsh and I thought I allowed for it and I still didn't allow enough for the conditions. And anyway, so I trialed a number of native plants to get the same effect. Um, and they were gonna be very much dominant parts of the garden, but as time has gone on, they have gradually transitioned or moved into the background and, um, and the wild elements have become more dominant, I feel. I mean, you may look at my garden and you, they, the formal structures definitely pop out, but I find now I need the degree of chaos 
to surround the formal structure. Otherwise, they just seem too harsh. I see formal gardens now. We people just have formal structure everywhere. Uh, I just find it just too harsh or too clean. I feel like um, I want them to be dressed. I want them to be dressed in the wild elements or loose chaotic elements. And so that's where I push harder and harder. I suppose I've seen so many formal gardens. I have made so many formal gardens and formal structures that it just doesn't really interest me to the same extent than it, than it did before. And so I will use them as an element, but um, I'm much more interested in experimenting and I come up with an idea and then it's a matter of, well, how far can you push that idea? How far can you push an idea before it gets broken? And I keep trying, but I haven't been able to break um, the sort of the, the idea of the garden that I like and it's very subjective. So um, I realize people may look at my garden in style and taste and just go, what are you doing? But um, it's, it's all for me. It's, um, I just love it. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with gardening and um, I just love it. Well, and that's the thing. It's definitely your style. It's very unique. And that's what, you know, immediately made it so attractive to me was how different it was from the way that we garden. Like you said, it's so formal, most places you go and everything has to be perfectly in place and to see the way that you've kind of developed. So for those of you who don't follow Kurt, uh, he's on Instagram, Kurt.Wilkinson. I definitely r recommend that you check out his page and look at his pictures. He started that piece of property. And this is why I think we clicked really well in the beginning because we both kind of came from a similar environment. When we when we bought our properties, it was very distressed, little to nothing. And it was kind of a blank, you know, blank palette to be able to start to create. And we both found a lot of peace in creation with plants. And so um, if you look back into a lot of his different posts, you can see some of the before and afters, which I love when you do that, because it was literally a dirt mound when you started um, the one area of the yard. So when you started with that, can you tell us a little bit about the plants that you kind of trialed and how did you find those plants? You've given me really incredible advice over the years about keeping a shovel in the trunk. Um, so if you can kind of touch on that, that would be great. Uh, well, I inherited the garden. It was um, the previous owners, um, they, had, they had gone through a similar process of trying to trial plants. They'd gone through roses and lots, lots more probably um, usual plants that people would try. And um, the other element as well, there we have kangaroos uh, and emus. I live very close to a national park. And so not only were the conditions harsh, but you'd also have animals coming in and just destroying things that you would have a similar thing with deer and all sorts of other things in your neck of the woods. Um, and, uh, and so I inherited a number of plants and I did not like them. I was so, uh, I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to use that. Five years later, love them using them all the time. Of course, uh, when you have limited options, it's amazing what, what plants and things you start liking. And you have to understand as well, you evolve and um, you see traits in plants that you don't see. You really have to open your eyes. You need to observe. And it's very handy if the conditions are very harsh and you, you experience a lot of failure. It's amazing the way you start perceiving plants that will survive. And so it was purely failure that made me completely change my considerations on all the things that I do and started embracing it. And then I did come across, once I went onto Instagram, I came across just a different style of gardening because you've got to consider in Adelaide, it's very conservative. We're a small town. We're not one of the bigger, sorry, a big, we're a small city. We're not one of the biggest cities in, in Australia. And so we are influenced heavily by the bigger cities. And then the bigger cities are influenced by what happens in Europe and in, in America. And so we're probably 20 years behind the fashion, I would suggest, in, um, in Adelaide. Hence why I was so formally oriented, because I thought this is, this is what's cool. This is what fashion is. Um, but... And I had no real understanding of history as far as history and horticulture and design. And then maybe five or six years ago, I started looking and I started going, oh my gosh, all these people are just copying all these sort of very um, existing styles. And I thought they're all original. And so that really kind of started making me think, what exactly is gardening? Where is it at? And then I got onto Instagram. I started seeing all these photos of these gardens and just realized, wow, the standard is so much higher than I thought, because it's sort of like a big fish in a small pond. I was sort of going around managing these very, very, um, very good gardens in Adelaide, some of the best gardens in Adelaide. 
And I just thought these were the bees and knees. And then you look internationally and you realize that there is a much, much higher standard to aim at, to achieve. And that just really inspired me. Um, and I needed that inspiration because I was failing. It was so hard. I was putting in so much time and effort into the garden and not getting the return. And then by seeing this much higher standard, it just it inspired me to keep on going because I'm just not sure whether I could have kept on going. What type of soil do you guys have there? Or what, what are you working with? Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's Because I'm on the top of a hill. It's very, very little topsoil. It's maybe it's a little bit loamy and then it gets clay. And it, I'm not sure whether you will get the same at your place. You can go over the property and something that will grow, even in my own, within three acres, something will grow in one area. It just will not grow in another area. And this is just, it just flabbergasted me so many times. And then this resulted in me just researching and researching and learning. It just, it's been a fantastic journey, even though, man, I just, I was so frustrated so many times, but um it has changed. It has changed the way I garden. It's changed so many things about, yeah, everything relating to horticulture and how I now manage some of my clients' gardens as well. Do you have you had to do any soil amendments, or did you do anything to the to the that vast area in the front of the house before you started landscaping? No, no that was nothing. one of the worst areas, and that was where I started because I started close to the house because I was sort of going all over the place because I still did a lot of earthworks and, and making tracks because I wanted to be able to get access to every area of the property. It is very steep and slopey. It may not look like that from the um, from photos that I post, but it is very, very slopey. And so I had to sort of reconfigure a few things. So I did bring in some soil from landscapers that they would dig up someone's lawn or backyard and they would bring it in and dump it at my place and I would spread it out and then I would go through and cut out tracks so we could get access everywhere so I've got a skid steer which is just great fun um, but uh, and then I did bring in things like um, I did bring in some compost and I did bring in some chicken manure in bulk but I really don't see that that had any influence and now I haven't done anything for about six or seven years I don't water anymore i don't fertilize i wow. don't really do anything i just and i and it just makes it so much easier so really the standard now is to make the best possible garden with the most skill possible with the least inputs with the least time inputs but still get a very high standard and that is very subjective but um it really is trying to use as much skill that i have learned over many years to get a good result with the least amount of effort possible because it is such a big space. And you would know too how much time these things take to manage a garden. Um, and so now that's sort of what I pursue as well. I let things happen. I'm interested in things and combinations I've never seen before. And so I can just let things happen and I'm much more interested in that experimenting and just seeing what happens. It's, um, I find that really, really exciting and interesting. I wanna see a, an original new garden every single year because the grasses grow in different spots and then they collapse and they break. And, and so, sorry, I'm in, I'm in my own little world and that's what I enjoy because I see that very structured, imitating conservative style in my work. And I've seen it so many times over 20 years that I don't need that. I could sort of get that from my clients' gardens and then I can do whatever I like and just experiment. And that's, that's what, really excites me and interests me in horticulture. So have you done quite a bit of propagation or how have you managed to spread so much so far? Um, when I, I, I inherited a, a small amount of succulents and then I didn't really want to use too many of them. And so then every year I would just like break off every single one of them. So I started with a couple of certain eoniums, which are like a tree uh, succulent. And then now I've got thousands. So every year I would just break them all off. And even then I was still very conservative. I was like, I don't want too many of these certain plants because I wanted to use these plants that are more fashionable and whatever. But every time I tried them, they would fail. And so gradually the numbers, because every year they would grow. And so you could break them off and I would just stick them in the ground. Like I am the laziest, slackest gardener you have ever seen because I have tried so many seeds, other things propagating and it's all failed. And so I just keep on just making it more and more simple. And the area is so big that you can't be too fussy. You have to just 
and I only plant in winter. I do not plant at any other time because that's when the conditions are mild enough and something has to establish before summer and then it's on its own. And if it dies, good, get it out of the system. So I am sort of going through this evolution selection process and hence why it's probably taken me so long. But now I think I could do the same thing and probably three to four years as opposed to 10 to 11 years um, because I just know you can just cut out so many of the failure points. It really is using your time and energy. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And you taught me that was the, there were a couple of times I know I'd sent you messages about different areas and pictures of different things. And that was really one of your responses was if it doesn't cut it, like stop fighting with it, you know, and I was found myself spending so much time and energy focusing on all the problems instead of letting the problems get out to make way and just trying experimenting with new things and bringing new things in and what would thrive and what didn't thrive. It does definitely make things a lot easier, but I don't think that's the American way. I think the American way is like, I spend the money on this. I'm going to put it in my guard and it's going to grow and I'm going to make it grow. And then you end up struggling and fighting and fussing when things just don't grow the way you want them to grow. And I feel like when you put your hands up and you say, okay, let's try something else. That's when you're able to build out larger pieces of property easier. Like you're saying with not fighting. Yeah. It is hard because it is that is the way gardening has been for so long and it's not just an american thing it's an australian thing and it's very much the fact that i think we are sort of garden obsessed so we're a little bit different to the average public and um and what you'll find is that the i realized this maybe a couple of years ago that like with the gardens that i maintain there's a lot of monocultures there's a lot of um structure like formal structure and so it requires a lot of inputs. Um, it requires a lot of energy. You're fighting pests and disease all the time. Whereas what I found with my place, the more you let it go and the less you're inputting things, you can stand back and you can consider the garden. If you're not having to spray for pests and disease, spray nutrients, things like that, you step back. And so, of course, I'm obsessed. I take photos of my garden constantly. But it's, it's the considering what you have and making it better rather than spending all your time just fighting. And so you never actually get to the time to sit back and consider what is it about the garden that you love and what elements that you like and what combinations. And that just, it just creates a completely different flow as opposed to just trying to fight this thing all the time and fighting nature. Nature will usually win. Eventually, it's only while you keep on pumping in the pesticides and the herbicides that you can keep this thing going but you've it's already such a compromised thing but anyway if people wish to do that they should do that but i don't think they realize what a challenge they are actually taking on so anyway that's no absolutely and that's one thing i've learned in the last you know couple of years is trying to control mother nature nothing will nothing will control her so trying to do things like the herbicides and the pesticides as a young gardener i was just kind of like it'll be fine. I'll do it. It's going to take care of the problem right now until I received my first big dose of, um, you know, thrips on the property and what has caused, so, you know, what's, what has taken this problem away and made it real good for me was the fact that I did not, you know, they would come in every year and say, well, we can treat your beds. We can spray the beds with, with pesticides so that you don't have to worry about the aphids and the spider mites and any spiders. And I said, that sounds great. You know, cause there's lots of things. We're on a tree line. There's lots of things in the garden. And so they were spraying every spring, it would start and carry all through. Well, it killed all my beneficial insects. So when the thrips came around, the thrips will adapt to any chemicals, to many chemicals. Mm. So I could not control them. This is now going into my third year of dealing with this. They made it through my entire property. This is the first year I did not treat with any pesticide and the problem has seemed to resolve itself. And I've got tons of different beneficials that are everywhere that are taking care of the problem for me instead of me trying to control it. So it, that really opened my eyes to gardening. This was a huge lesson for me. It makes it so much more fun. And as so say, not only are you working with nature and you know, I'm, the, I'm not at some ideologue as far as just green, 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 because sometimes maybe you need to manage something, sure. but it's good to have many many sort of um, options open to you and um, as a side note when when you get these outbreaks of pest and disease it's nature trying to actually remove that plant from the environment that these things are there to actually sort of get rid of the weak and sad plants 
so that the better plants will survive. And unfortunately in horticulture, we are trying to keep too many poor specimens alive because we love them because we're growing something out of its range where it's not photosynthesizing to its peak. And we are trying to keep them because we love them. Whereas nature is sending everything in its power to try and actually remove that from the system. And so and here we are just trying to tinker away, trying to keep these things alive. And it's just, um, I think it is such a waste of energy and time, but people love it. I know it's an element of horticulture. It's like the skill of, I can keep this plant alive, which would never grow here, but I can, I can play that game. And that is definitely a skill. But I think after a while, unless you're an absolute expert, it, it, it just becomes too hard. It's exhausting. And that's what happened with me. I mean, I was so frustrated last year of having to constantly go out and spray and constantly go out and take care of this every single mm. day. I had to do it that, and then, you know, I just, I, I just, eventually you give up, you know, it's just too yeah. exhausting. And then they just you don't even over. get to enjoy the garden. No, you, you don't. don't. You, and you don't even want to go in time. it. Yeah. You don't even want to go in it because you don't want to see it be destroyed. So luckily this is now, I think it's under control. I had to deal with, you know, one of the tips that I give to people here is if you're having an issue that's above and beyond where you're able to get help, I called the department of agriculture. I called the, the Missouri department of conservation, and I was able to talk to them about the issues I was having and then come up with a plan. So, and that's for another episode, but it was a yeah. plan very simple uh, that I was able to take on in the spring when I noticed that they were here. And uh, ever since then, I mean, fingers crossed, it's been, you know, smooth sailing. So um, you should have, you should have found a friend. You should have called me. I know, right? Well, I was, <laughs> I've been so scared to say anything like, you know, knocking on wood oh, every we, time I talk about it. We need it. to talk. We'll talk later. I've, I've got more ideas, but anyway. Sorry. Uh, well, tell me a little bit about one of the other things that you introduced me to was um, Pete Oldoof and studying his plantings. And one of the things that are, is, is very prominent in your garden is the year round interest. Tell us what that is and why it's so important. Um, well, I want, uh, I want to be in the garden and enjoying it every single day of the year. I mean, I spend so much time in it photographing and it wasn't it was definitely Pete Aldorf seeing his work on um, Instagram and then pursuing and looking on YouTube to see videos. And I had just never seen gardens like that. Um, I'm, I was so naive. Um, and that was probably only six years ago that I started seeing this. And it was just like an emotional connection. I had just never seen gardens so beautiful before. Like I was saying, I'm sort of, I was very much cocooned in Adelaide and what I consider to be, you know, really good gardens in Adelaide. And now I just see that there's so much more to gardening. And so I just, it just inspired me so much. It's so important, I think, in any field that you come across people that just inspire you to reach such a higher standard. And if I hadn't seen that, there's just no way I would be where I am now and just keep on pushing, pushing, pushing to come up with new ideas and, and to see new things. And so Pete Order was such a massive um, influence. Not so much anymore. I don't really, like the last sort of two to three years, now I just focus on my own garden and my own ideas. I do not spend time. I don't really want to be influenced by other people anymore, which may seem really, really silly, but it's really just a process of doing your own thing, seeing what happens and then trying new ideas and new ideas. And so that's what I do now, but it was so important six years ago, but now I just focus on, on myself, which um, seems there's only so many hours in the day. You would know yourself. There's only so many hours that you can do gardening. And I figure, you know, maybe I've got five or 10 years left as I'm getting older as well. And so I do not want to waste time. I want to see what I can achieve because I'm just one person. I've done everything myself. Um, the whole garden I've planted, almost every plant except for a few plants are already here. And so the connection, I have, I have an emotional connection with my garden as you probably do with yours as other people. But it's sort of like I experience the garden different to somebody else because I, I know how hard certain things were. And so I get satisfaction in a different way. And so I garden for myself because I do all the physical labor. So when I come up with an idea, I have to assess if I do this idea, I'm going to have to do all this physical labor. How many years is it going to take? And so I didn't even realize I go through this kind of filter process where I assess my own physical exertions to achieve this result. And I'll go, no, nah, idea is not good enough. But if the idea seems amazing, I will do it even if it's a chance of failure. 
because I'm just so excited by the idea. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm a little bit messed up and crazy. No, no. But that's, no just, that's just wonderful. how I do it because life is so short and you just got to find joy, I think, in your life. And so I just try to have fun. It really just gets to that point when you move aside from this fighting nature and you just work with it and you just have fun. And then it's a surprise. It's like, we're just going to do these things and let's just see what happens and then just enjoy that. And maybe you tweak it or you push this idea a bit harder and it just makes I don't know, it makes everything so much more fun to um, just, to pl it's playing. You just play in the garden. You don't, I think so many people, they look in magazines, they look in books, they get this, I want to make that. It's really quite hard. It's much harder than you think, unless that environment is exactly the same as yours. Gardening can be really quite difficult, especially when you're trying to achieve a high standard. If you just, you know, eh, I don't care, maybe that's easy. But as soon as you want a really, really good garden, it is hard. It is challenging. Anyway, sorry, I won't, I won't try not to get off track. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. What's your, what's your favorite plant to use to that, that you have a, a, around the property? Like what, or, oh, or what's evergreens? Like I know we've seen, and let's touch on this for like a minute. Okay. Because one thing I want to note is for everybody to know that you are a phenomenal topiarist. Um, and if you can explain a little bit about what topiary is and kind of give a, a little bit of a crumb for that, we are going to have you on again soon in the next few weeks to discuss all of your topiary business and how you sculpt these magnificent creations in these gardens. But can you kind of give a little, a little bit of information? Sure, sure. So, um, so that was definitely my expertise. And I, I wonder how much that has influenced the way I design now, because even though I, I try to leave it very, very loose. There is that element of controlling plants that I think sort of carries over. But um, so certainly I experimented with a number of um, native plants to use as topiary uh, elements. And um, it's very, very important because when you make a topiary, you're taking so many risks because you're going to invest all this time and effort into this plant to turn it into whatever shape you want to do. Um, and if it dies after five or 10 years or 15 years, you've wasted that investment. And people don't realize how risky topiary is. And I've got to try and stay away from talking about it too much. Um, but uh, I, I think when you do use topiary in your garden, they should be used in asymmetric ways. As soon as you use them in symmetrical ways, if one dies, the whole design fails. And I look at people's designs and the way they use topiary. And I just think it's very, very risky when you use them in, in symmetrical ways. And so I'm always interested in using them asymmetric ways, making them trail, making them, making them do something interesting. I think people rely too much on a topiary to do all the heavy lifting. And I just think, I just don't think that's the way to go. And I only, only think that because I've spent 20 years managing them. You know, I've done over probably 10,000 balls or domes or whatever. And so I've just seen, I've just learned so much. Um, and so now I'm, I'm very, very critical as to how topiary should be used. I don't think people realize the risk they take when they use them. And sorry, get back to the question. Have I answered the question exactly because I've, I've got off track already? Oh, I've lost the audio. Have I? Oh, no, you're you good. Me? You're good. Oh, yes, sorry. I can hear you. Um, we only have a couple more minutes. So that's a, a great. Uh, and topiary, for those of you who don't know, is, you know, the rounded boxwoods, the shapes in the garden that Kurt is known for. So um, definitely check out his uh, Instagram page, Kurt.Wilkinson. How else can we find more about you, learn more about you? I know you've been written up in a couple of different things, some videos. How can uh, our audience learn more about you? Um, I suppose you can search on um, just in Google. Um, there was uh, did a, a gardening TV show a couple of years ago, just a short segment, and there's a few other bits and pieces. And there, there's some more stuff coming out soon um, at some point with some other media and uh, books and things like that. And uh, so yeah, so there's some, but not too much. But um, no, we'll, we'll have a few more chats, Melissa. We can talk and get very technical on topiary and so many things. I can talk rubbish for a very long time. <laughs> well, that's what that's what these crazy gardeners want to hear. So we're all for it. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and um, 
wrap it up, I want to just give a reminder uh, to engage if this podcast has been something that has taught you or that you've enjoyed. Please make sure that you show a little bit of love. It is a rough, rough world in the social media environment these days. So we do need that subscribe, like, send, comment, save, whatever you can do to show a little bit of love. We would appreciate that. So thank you so much, Kurt, for your time tonight. And we will definitely be back in touch with you soon and bring on some more wonderful information. Thanks for the inspiration that you've given me. And um, I hope everybody checks out your page and is able to be inspired by your work as well. So thanks again. Sure. Thanks, Mel. Have a good night. Bye-bye. See ya.